Hello, my name is Luann Duick-Plett and I'm a social worker. I work for Seniors Mental Health in the Southern area of Prairie Mountain Health. I'm gonna pull up my presentation now. So today I'll be sharing an It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Families for Older Adults presentation to help you make a difference in the lives of older adults experiencing abuse or neglect. By the end of our time together, I want you to feel more able to recognize and respond to signs of abuse and to know how to find help. This is the century when we're realizing that every action has impact. We can feel the impact when good and, things, good and bad things happen anywhere in the world. We are learning just how connected and interdependent we are in the 21st century. The pandemic has highlighted this for us. Yet many people feel powerless to make social change. This is an idea that we're challenging today. Small, kind actions can make a big difference and they add up. They matter. Think about a time when someone said something mean to you. How long did it impact you? Think next about a time someone said something kind that changed everything for you. And maybe they have no idea that what they said made such a big difference. Your smallest action has an impact of some kind. The challenge is to be thoughtful and responsible about the kind of impact you want to have. You power applies to all situations every day. Let's focus now on what you can do to support older adults who may be experiencing abuse or neglect. We start here with the non-negotiables. Everyone has a right to be safe and free from abuse or neglect. And we have a shared responsibility to promote respect for all members of our society and to work together to create safe, strong, healthy communities. Everyone has a role to play and we need every person to make their unique contribution. Ageism is the term used to describe attitudes and beliefs that cause older people to treat older adults, that cause people to treat older adults as if they were less important or less valued because they are older. These attitudes are a factor in abusive situations because they allow people to believe that they have the right to ignore or control the older adult. Have you ever thought to yourself, kids spend too much time on screens? Or have you ever followed behind a slow driver and thought, must be an old person? These are examples of ageism because they make a general statement about all kids or all older adults that can't possibly be true in all situations. We all have ageist attitudes. Anytime you hear yourself say those people or they always or they never, try to hear the generalization you are making as a stereotype that does a disservice to individuals and that contributes to perpetuating the, id the isms such as ageism, racism, and sexism. Stereotyping is very common and we have to make an effort to recognize it in ourselves first. So what is abuse? There's lots of discussion about the definition as there's currently no single agreed upon definition. There's also disagreement about what to call it as the term elder means different things to different groups. For this presentation, we're talking about abuse that happens to older adults. The World Health Organization defines abuse of older adults as a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there's an expectation of trust, which causes harm or distress to an older person. While the universal definition may be undecided, there are specific qualities that can help us identify abuse. Abuse is harm caused by someone who limits or controls older adults' rights and freedoms, and the older adults are unable to freely make choices because they're afraid of being hurt, humiliated, left alone, or of their relationship ending. So an abusive relationship is different, though, from situations where two people are in conflict with each other. These people may do things to hurt each other, they may be abusive in their behavior toward each other, and their fights can escalate to violence. However, both people have power in the relationship. One person does not live in fear of the other. Their rights and freedoms are not oppressed. Both parties are able to make choices about what happens next. People need help and support in these situations, 
but they're not being abused in the way we're going to focus on in this presentation, where abusive tactics are used by one person deliberately or unintentionally to maintain power over another person in a way that controls their movements and choices. And neglect of older adults who cannot manage on their own is also abuse. Abuse is a misuse of power of some kind. It can make a person feel small, alone, and powerless. Abuse is not just physical violence. It can also be verbal, emotional, financial, sexual, or spiritual. And often more than one type of abuse occurs at the same time. The most commonly reported type of older adult abuse of older adults is financial. Abusive behavior can be obvious or it can be really subtle and hard to see. It may be a single incident or a pattern, a repeated pattern of behavior. Abuse happens along a continuum of violence. There are warning signs that we want everyone to be able to recognize, such as, if I tell you I'm being abused, believe me. I become depressed or withdrawn or fearful. I stop attending social events or church. Someone suddenly moves in with me. Signs of neglect, such as no food in the house. My phone is cut off or some, things start disappearing from my house. I have injuries I can't explain. Warning signs don't, mean, don't automatically mean abuse is happening. Um, a warning sign should flag your attention, lead you to look more closely and ask questions. Other warning signs of abusive behavior and things people may say to justify their behavior. They might blame the older adult. There might be a strong sense of entitlement. They may treat the older adult like a child. There may be arguments and name calling. And they may leave a dependent person alone for periods of time. Isolation is often a factor in abusive relationships. Everyone in and around an abusive relationship can be isolated. As bystanders, we can feel isolated, unsure about what to do, and afraid of making a mistake. We are alone with our fears and concerns. For the people caught in an abusive relationship, as a violence escalates, which it often does, the isolation becomes deeper and more profound. Um, some people may be isolated because of culture or language. The person abusing me might keep me away from people who can help. And as abuse escalates, I become more and more isolated. Isolation has been heightened during the pandemic. Telehealth doctor appointments, closed senior centers, suspended meal programs, and online religious and cultural services. One national advocate estimated about a 250% increase in abuse and neglect of older people in Canada during the pandemic, particularly around financial and physical abuse. There are other risk factors too. Living with someone, addictions, dependence on the older adult for money, food, or shelter, depression and mental health issues, and cognitive impairment. People who are abusive can be charming, well-liked leaders of their communities in public and violent, cruel offenders behind closed doors. Older adults affected by abuse often know and trust the person mistreating them. It may be family or others who provide assistance with basic needs and services. We want to find ways to help everyone involved in abusive relationships. The focus of the It's Not Right campaign is to support the bystanders who often know that abuse is happening, but don't know what to do about it. When people have trouble in their relationships, you may be the neighbor, friend, or family member who can make a positive difference. If you are concerned that an older adult in your life may be experiencing abuse, this information can help you to recognize the warning signs and know what to do. 
I'm going to share a video with you so we can practice what we've learned so far. Watch for warning signs of abuse in this video and things that make you feel uncomfortable. Are you sure you're going to be comfortable in the basement? Yeah, there's plenty of room, Mom. Besides, your granddaughter will never be home. You're a lifesaver, Mom. I don't know what I would have done without you. I'm sure you're going to find another job in no time. <laughs> You mind if I watch a movie? By the way, your bank card was rejected at the gas station today. It was really embarrassing. What are you talking about? I went to fill up my car and it wouldn't go through. It must be overdrawn or something. You better hope your check comes in this week and you're not gonna be able to get your prescriptions refilled. What are you doing? I can't get used to the damp downstairs. Oh, try another blanket, Mom. We're boiling up here. You know, I would have wished you would have asked me before you moved me into the basement. Why do you have to be on my back, Mom? It's too dark and dingy down there. I get depressed, you know that. You can play your puzzles down there as well as you can up here. <laughs> What's for dinner, Grams? I'm starving. What did you see in that video? Abuse? What were the warning signs, the risk factors? What tips the power balance? Well, we saw financial abuse. The son uses his mother's bank card without her knowledge for his expenses. This is a crime. He has no legal authority to access her money, use her bank card, or open her mail for the purpose of seeking funds. We saw emotional abuse. Uh, moving her to the basement without asking and disregarding her wishes. Some of the risk factors, uh, the son is dependent and without a job. Uh, they're living together. Uh, we didn't necessarily know this, but he suffers from depression and he might use alcohol. This is an escalating situation. The abusive behavior that we saw is controlling behavior, a disregard for the fact that this is Carla's house. Uh, she's not allowed to freely make decisions and choices. Um, there's a strong sense of entitlement and they treat Carla like a child. Some of the ageist attitudes that are implicit in this scene, um, the idea that the son is entitled to mom's money, home and time, and that mom's wants and needs are important. Um, Michael might not even see himself as breaking the law or behaving abusively because of the entitlement. There's both ageism and sexism. Sexism in the sense that women have less rights and are assumed to be available to serve the family. Who has the power? Well, Michael has the power. Um, he assumes that he can just use his mother's assets without asking. And Carla's concern for Michael erodes her power in the relationship because Michael takes advantage of it. The harm here is that Michael is breaking the law. He's using her resources. He's modeling disrespect to her daughter, his daughter, and he's undermining his relationship with his mother by treating her without regard for her wants and wishes as a person with equality. So we've been talking about recognizing abuse. Now let's talk about responding with support. Learning how to respond safely and effectively is a journey. We have to overcome the hesitation to help and centuries of training to mind your own business. We have to learn how to be supportive and not controlling ourselves. It's not the role of the bystander to solve abuse for someone else. We also want to learn how to have the conversation with people we're worried about. So for your journey, I'd like to share a conversation framework that you can use. 
These are three things we believe everyone can do. See it, name it, check it. This is the see it, name it, check it conversation framework. The goal is to interrupt the isolation that exists in all abusive relationships by providing practical tools and tips for the people closest to older adults who may be experiencing abuse. Step one, see it. Learn about abuse so that you can recognize the different warning signs. It's easy to ignore warning signs and to tell yourself that you must be mistaken or it's not that bad because there's only one warning sign. Trust your instincts when something makes you feel uncomfortable. Pay attention to red flags that could be warning signs. A warning sign might be the tip of an iceberg. There might be more going on below the surface. Some people think abuse is normal or understandable, but it is never acceptable and it always causes harm. When you see a warning sign, say to yourself, it's not right. This will help you move to the next step. Name it. Once you recognize abuse, you may feel uncertain about how to become involved. You're not alone. It's understandable to hesitate but you will need to overcome your hesitation to interrupt the isolation that Carla is experiencing. Abuse won't go away without help. If it is safe, talk to the person you think is being abused. Wait for a time when you're alone and not likely to be interrupted. Approach the person with care and concern. You might say, Michael moved you downstairs. It's just a fact, no judgment. Describe just the facts of what you witness. For example, do say, I saw him take the money. Don't use judgmental language like, I saw him stealing from your wallet. Remember, just the facts. Check it. We want everyone to pay attention and take warning signs seriously. And a warning sign does not automatically mean that abuse is happening. Don't jump to conclusions. If you see a warning sign, ask questions. Don't assume you know what is happening. If possible, check with the person you think is being abused first. The way to do that is with the see it, name it, check it conversation. Check for immediate danger. If you think the situation is dangerous, call 911. If you have questions and want to speak to police, ask to speak to an officer who's been trained in family or domestic violence. The goal of the see it, name it, check it conversation is to open the door for support. Let's watch what happens next. Watch for the impact Francesca's response has on Carla. How are things going with your son being home? Oh, I feel badly for him. He's having such a hard time of it. He and his daughter moved upstairs on the weekend. And where does that leave you? In the spare room. In the basement? Oh, I am sorry, but that is going too far. You still cater to his every whim when what he really needs is a swift kick in the pants. If you don't put your foot down, he's never going to leave that couch. Never mind, look for a job. So... Is the door open for Carla? Will she share more about what she's experiencing? Will she ask Francesca for help? Francesca's response here is not supportive. It's understandable to feel upset by what's happening and to want it to stop, right? But you can see the impact as Carla closes down. You can see it in her face and body language. If Francesca blames Carla for allowing the abuse to happen, She's blaming her for her son's behavior. This is victim blaming, and it happens a lot. Blaming Carla will cause more hurt for Carla and for their friendship. It's not right to blame Carla for her son's behavior. Remember, there are power imbalances in Carla's relationship with her son. If, Carla, if Francesca wants to be supportive, she has to change her response to open the door for Carla. Let's watch for the impact on Carla as Francesca tries again. How 
How are things going with your son being home? Oh, I feel badly for him. He's having such a hard time of it. He and his daughter moved upstairs on the weekend. And where does that leave you? In the spare room. In the basement? I'm worried about you. Your life has changed so much. Are you okay? Frances Francesca's response this time is supportive. She sees the disorder in Carla's house and asks a question. She names her concern. She listens. She makes contact with Carla. And she checks and asks a question. Are you okay? Responding to abuse does not mean that you have to solve another person's problems. There are two handles for a see it, name it, check it conversation. Safety and respect. Ask yourself, is it safe and am I being respectful? We don't know what will happen next, but we can see from Carla's response that she seems to appreciate the concern. She may not want to talk anymore about what is happening, and that has to be okay with Francesca. Carla's life is not a problem for Francesca to solve. The move from doing four and two others and solving their problems, there's a shift from doing to responding. This means you have to pay attention to the person you want to support. Look for the Learn to look for the impact of your words and approach. Are you opening the door or closing it? People's face and body language will tell you a lot if you pay attention. So will Carla confide in her friend? It seems possible, and that's a good outcome for Francesca. The door is open. Even if Carla does not go through the door, Francesca can feel good about trying and about leaving the door open. Things may happen, that may take longer for Carla. Francesca should respect that. And if she sees new warning signs, she can see it, name it, check it again. Francesca does one other thing. She interrupts the isolation. In most cases of abuse, without an interruption to the pattern or dynamic, it will escalate increasing in frequency and or severity. As the abuse increases, so too does the isolation for both the person per perpetrating the abuse and the person experiencing it. If isolation is always present in abuse, then interrupting the isolation is a strategy to reduce or eliminate it. We do this to provide support and increase safety. A see it, name it, check the conversation is one way to interrupt the isolation. If we're going to interrupt the isolation, wherever it occurs, then we can start with ourselves and the way we can become isolated with our fears and concerns when abuse is happening to someone we care about. If you need support, talk to someone you trust about what to do next or consult a professional. In order to see it, name it, check it, check it with safety and respect and interrupt the isolation, wait for a time when the person behaving abusively is not present. This is important for safety. Listen carefully. Ask questions to open the door. Don't expect that the person will tell you the first time. It's really hard to admit you're being abused. There's often a lot of shame in admitting it. If the person does start to talk, Give them the time it takes to tell their story. It may not happen all at once. If the older adult says there's no abuse happening, don't press. There's no harm in voicing your concern and then simply saying, I'm here if you need me. Your goal is to keep the door open. If not today, then maybe later, or maybe there really is no abuse. Just don't close the door on future conversations. You don't have to have it all figured out to talk to the person you're concerned about. You don't have to know what to do. In fact, it's really up to the older adult to figure out what they want to do. Your role is more of a supporting role. 
You want to be with the person. If you start from the place of care and concern, you'll be more successful in help opening the door for them to disclose to you what is happening. To summarize, the journey to see it, name it, check it starts with heart. You see it, you name it, and you check it. As you take these steps, hold on to the two handles safety and respect. Is it safe and is my action respectful? The outcome of your see it, name it, check it conversation may be a disclosure of, disclosure of abuse. Here are some helpful things you can say if this occurs. I care about you. I believe you. It's not your fault. I'm worried about your safety. I'll support you in your decisions. So in supporting the older adult, in deciding what they want to do, there's a few options that I thought I'd bring to your attention. Manitoba has a seniors abuse support line that is 24 hours a day. It's a toll free number that's listed there. There's also Agent Opportunity has a program called the Elder Abuse Prevention Services that you could contact for consultation. Oftentimes, um, the people who might be able to help the older adult are people who are already involved in their, in their situation. It might be their family doctor, home care, services to seniors coordinators, uh, Prairie Mountain Health, Seniors Mental Health, which is the program I work for, credit unions, police. These are just some ideas. You might be interested in some written resources. Um, the It's Not Right campaign has a number of helpful brochures available online. And there are other um, brochures that are linked there uh, that may be helpful. Change happens in everyday ways. We want to engage the power and potential of relationships to make change in the lives of people who are experiencing abuse. We're all part of a community. Share what you've learned today with others in your network. We all have a role to play in creating the safe, supportive communities that we all want to live and grow old in. You may never know how that little gesture of kindness you make towards someone might make a difference. For every person who takes action of any kind, it's impossible to know how far the information will travel and who will be affected. Remember, you don't have to be the hero or fix the situation. Caring about the people around us, paying attention to them when there are signs of trouble and responding appropriately can be, make a big difference. Little things count. You have the power. Thank you. And that's um, my presentation for today. Appreciate you uh, listening today. Thank you.